2,000 points there. Um, and you know, on, on, on this laptop, we can go up to, um, I, I'm sorry, I should have actually tested what it is, but it's three years old. Um, I'm, I'm confident we get to about a million points uh, without too much trouble. You see how much memory it takes. Um, and in fact, you can even bring up um, uh, one of the views that you can do is, is do a statistics inspector. And so as you add other things to this, uh, to this pipeline, you can actually uh, uh, see some information about them in a, in a tabular form. So, good question. Okay, you know, and then you can use those because a lot of times you'll, you'll you think you've done everything right. You'll ask for a representation, and nothing comes up. And sometimes you come over to the information, you see there was some type of error, you know, or your sizes weren't right. Other questions? Okay, so hmm, well, that's not uh, terribly useful. And one of the problems here is that the data is. Um, um, uh, they're just points, so I lose a lot of the depth information. So there's any uh, number of things that we'll actually do to try to pull out some more information. But a simple thing I can do is go to the, uh, the glyph icon here. So I can go up here to, uh, I can do one of two things. I can get a, uh, uh, so all the things that you can do with a, with a data set are in the, uh, in the filters um, uh, menu. And it's pretty long there, so they've tried to create some, uh, some subcategories, things you've recently used, things most people use, and so forth. Um, and the very, very com most common things, they've also put little icons out here. So with whatever I want to apply this next operation to, I'm going to link these things together. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to select the glyph filter. Okay. And again, remember that in order to actually see anything, I have to hit uh, apply there. And then if you look really carefully, um, you'll actually see some arrows. So in fact, what I'm going to do is turn off the points. Now I've got an arrow glyph. That's, that's not terribly helpful, but I can go and adjust this. I can make, uh, make this a, uh, uh, say, a box. And I happen to know from some experimenting with this that I believe value of 0.2. Uh, so now I finally make that's the beauty of, uh, of this, is that um, because it's interactive, you know, rather than changing your code, it invites uh, experimentation uh, with the various parameters, because as you can see, there's a lot of parameters that, that you could adjust. And by the way, if you are more programming oriented, uh, there are ways you can actually uh, use Paraview to sort of um, uh, experiment with different combinations of representations. And then it can give you some hints uh, through a state file and some other things where you could actually go and make your own program uh, if you wanted to. Um, in most cases, you don't. So here's one of those cases where, again, what it's doing to try to uh, keep things interactive is, as you can see on the screen, it's actually uh, changing the representation. And it's also done something here in this glyph mode where it's actually masked out the points. So it only gave me, if I turned on my original points, I would see that it has not shown me all the 32,000. There's only 5,000 boxes there. So if I really wanted to tax my graphics system, I can say, don't mask out points. Give me all of them. Okay. And then, again, I've got them here. Um, and then I can also go and turn off this, uh, this level of detail stuff if I don't want to see that, that kind of weird uh, polygonalization. So that's not terribly interesting. Um, so what I'm going to hit, do is hit the little disconnect thing, and that's just kind of a way of starting over uh, very quickly. You can also see that you can bring multiple views up here, and when you bring up additional views, you can make them 3D view, uh, spreadsheet view. They've added a lot of functionality recently for different types of st statistical analysis, plots, histograms, and so forth. Okay. But remember we said it works well for temporal data. So what I'm going to do is just gather all of these time steps. I only got 10 out of the, uh, I think there was something on the order of uh, 2,800 uh, here. And uh, now I have all the data sets loaded. But it doesn't make sense to put them all in there at once. So what it's done is actually um, uh, it will give me an option so I can actually uh, step through this. Uh, and if you notice the little time counter up there in the upper right. So the first time it was a little bit slow, but then the next time uh, it can go faster. And so as you delve into uh, the settings, you can actually make this, you can adjust 
the speed that it plays back and so forth, and use that same thing. So you can animate over time while you might also be anim uh, moving the camera as well and adjusting some other parameters. So this is what they uh, commonly refer to as just the buzzy dots. You know, this is actually what was going on in the, in, the, uh, in the code, but again, it didn't really help give them more insight. They kind of knew that these particles were exerting forces on each other and that they were uh, uh, you know, writing out the time steps uh, from uh, between times. So I'm going to uh, uh, disconnect from this and show how we might do that one better and this, I'm going to actually take advantage of the state files that Paradu has. So uh, a state file just simply you know, captures what you were doing at that time so you can restore it uh, at, at any point in, in the future. So it remembers what files you read in, what filters you applied to it, how you had your windows set up, um, how the parameters were adjusted. And so I want to actually um, interest of time. Let me just jump ahead. What I was going to say is what was more interesting than just looking at the points is really seeing how the points behaved over time. So one of the things that he did uh, was actually just took the difference between two consecutive time steps. Uh, so the, like the tenth point in the first file is the same, uh, represents the same molecule as the tenth point in the second file. So if we, we use some, some tricks within Paraview uh, to actually calculate that vector data from two points, then we can actually see some more information, which points were moving fast, uh, which ones weren't moving so fast. And so in fact, uh, I think if I bring this up, I can just show you, uh, again, talking about the, uh, the intuition that you get. Um, and what you'll find without getting into all the details over here is there's a lot of movement at the edges and that you know, is natural because we've run into some boundary conditions there. And uh, as we get towards the center of the data set, uh, the movement is actually much smaller. Um, and so uh, proper interpretation, according to the scientists, pay less attention to the stuff on the outside um, uh, because of that. Let me load up another state file. Another thing that we did um, is to, rather than um, Treating this as point data, we went through an external process where we took that point data and converted it into a grid of data. Uh, we, um, uh, in this case, a 128 by 128 by 128 grid. And we took each point, and according to the scientists, that it was not the absolute location of that molecule or that neutron, but it was a, a statistical representation of its probability being there. So we did a, a Gaussian splat of that point into, of each point into uh, uh, this volume. So now we can actually bring to bear some additional representation techniques because there's only so much you can do with the points. So we've, we've now converted it to a, a regular grid of densities. So now we can do something uh, such as uh, apply an ISO service. So you can see I, I read in a, a raw file here, uh, which is just a, a stream of bits, a stream of um, actually uh, this is kind of important for you to know. So you have to tell it uh, you know, what type of data uh, it's a big Indian or little Indian uh, dimensionality, and, and then the spacing. Uh, so then if you just have uh, you know, uh, some, some simple binary files, this is a nice way to, uh, to get going. You don't have to write a file uh, converter. And then we're applying what we call the ISO surface, or we're setting a contour here for the value of 25. So now, um, and that's already executed there. And so now I can change the viewpoint there. So what we're seeing is, these surfaces represent uh, regions of higher density and lower density. Stuff on the outside is lower density. The stuff inside these isosurfaces or contours is higher density. So that's one way to, OK, so this is better now. So now I'm not just seeing a whole bunch of points. Now I'm starting to see uh, these little uh, nuclear pasta clusters uh, beginning to form. Another possibility is to use what we call um, uh, volume rendering. That one, and I'll turn off the ISO surface. And again, um, sorry, uh, hopefully IU people you can follow along on WebEx, so you can actually see some of this. Uh, hopefully, it comes out better on the other sides. But now we're taking advantage of the, uh, uh, the volume rendering hardware uh, or the graphics hardware that's available uh, 
in most common laptops these days. Um, and of course, you can't see it. But again, we get even a, a better representation. And we're going straight to the data. We don't have to go through an additional step of extracting out an ISO surface. Uh, we're going to the original volume data and uh, in, in representing that. So, let me jump back over to the slides for a bit. So again, those are some of the things that we did with nuclear pasta. And uh, again, the, the, the lessons to, to learn here is that the given data, in most cases, should just be the beginning of what you want to do. There's no single right way to visualize most data. There are definitely some wrong ways. You can do some things that, that introduce visual artifacts or, or um, uh, cause the scientists to see something that it really isn't there in, in the data. So you do need to um, uh, uh, work wisely to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, and certainly some representations are better for others. Uh, but again, th this invites that experimentation uh, uh, that I think is, is really important. Uh, and uh, like I said, you know, I think I said this earlier, that you know, lets you uh, test out various parameters and then you can convert things back to a VTK program uh, or a VTK uh, script using Python or one of the many uh, other uh, programming capabilities. So. Uh, I want to look at just another data set to show you, you know, something that starts off very different. This is actually a uh, uh, seismic tomography from uh, uh, Gary Pavlis. So they're actually using part of the U.S. array. So if you look over there on the left, uh, these are the places where they have all of the seismographs uh, that are sitting out there in the field. And they collect, they're actually moving this array. They didn't have enough to cover the whole U.S., so they're doing uh, a third at a time. They're moving them to the Midwest, and then they're moving them uh, to the East Coast, but you see the location of all of the um, all the seismographs there uh, over the U.S. Uh, uh, the western part of the U.S. And then what they're doing is com uh, using that to, to do uh, uh, seismic tomography, and so they're computing uh, through a high-performance computing application uh, what's going on below the Earth's crust. So if you look over there on the right, you can see that curvature. That is the curvature of the Earth there. So. Given that, we have to work with a curvilinear grid. So now there's no implied coordinates. We have to explicitly say where those coordinates are and what the data values are within there. Uh, we'll also see that we do a lot of slicing and clipping because when we first bring it up, it doesn't look like there's a lot to see. And the interesting stuff, again, is down inside the data set. Uh, and so we want to show how we can do some, a few things there. Um, so how we might convert that data to gather some more insights. Okay, let's clear this off. And file open and apply. And so here's the data. You can see a slight curvature there. Um, I can also go under the display option. Remember I said that that every filter had uh, some, some mapping stuff uh, implied in it. So if you go to this middle panel, uh, this panel looks exactly the same uh, or pretty much the same for every, every filter that you put up there. Uh, the information looks pretty similar too. The properties are going to be the unique things for that particular filter. So while it looks pretty intimidating, uh, keep in mind that display, learn it once, it applies everywhere. Information, the same thing. You should check the information, see what we got. Um, We've got uh, uh, 2,470 cells uh, with uh, 3,000 some odd points. And I can also see the range of the data there uh, and then the, the dimensionality. What I wanted to show you for, with the, uh, uh, the display, that if I scroll down here, right now it's showing outline. I can say, you know, show it to me as points, show it to me as wireframe. That probably gives me the best sense of what's going on. Um, the structure of the grid. Now, it won't show you this, this stuff inside, but obviously there's, there's stuff uh, going on inside. Now, if I bring up a surface, the thing that's important to note here is that um, we have now a volume of, of, of intensities and actions. So there's, there's a value stored here.